All right, I mm -hmm. believe I believe we are officially live. Hello, Arty peoples, and welcome to another episode of Jerry's Live, specifically the last episode of 2021. This is the last one of this year uh, before we go on a little bit of a break, uh, before we go, come back in January. But I am very, very honored to have Andrew Cook with us. So Andrew Cook here is uh, going to be giving us an amazing demonstration. I am so excited. Uh, you have some awesome things planned for us, don't you? I do. I, do. I, I hope that it'll be a lot of fun for all of us. It's going to be awesome. So if you guys are interested in what Andrew is going to be demonstrating for us, uh, make sure you go to the website jerrysardorama.com and type in today's class code, which today's class code is JL222. So 222. Uh, and if you uh, type that into the search bar, all of the teacher's cart should come up with everything that he's going to be showing us. So without further ado, Andrew, please take it away. Fantastic. Thank you, Emmy. I really appreciate that. Uh, so I have my, my handy dandy notes here because I, I get really nervous at the beginning of these. Uh, but as we warm up, I'll be less nervous and I'll look more at everybody. Uh, but some of you may have, have seen me last year or earlier this year. Now, last year I was on and we were already talking about oil paint and I had covered some of the more common black pigments and then some of the lesser known black colors like peach black and neutral tint that Sennelier makes. So today I wanted to do a really deep dive into greens. I think green is a really underrated color and I think there's a lot to learn there. Uh, but before I do that, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Andrew Cook and I am the education manager for Sennelier in the US. Uh, I'm an artist and I've worked in the art materials industry for uh, over a decade now. So I've, I've been here a little while uh, and I'm, I'm a big art supply nerd. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to, to pop them in the chat there. I, I love getting questions, love answering questions. So uh, try and stump me, I, I'm all for it. So, and for those of you who are not familiar with Sennelier, off there. Uh, Sennelier is a paint manufacturer, an art supply manufacturer based out of uh, France, out of Paris, and they started their art supply store in Paris in 1887. Uh, we are in the fourth generation of the Sennelier family running the Sennelier store, and it is on the Rive Gauche right across from the Louvre. So if you're in Paris, make sure to stop by and say hi. So today, as I noted, we're going to be talking about oil paint. And Sennelier has been making oil paint pretty much since just after they, they took over the Sennelier store in France in 1887. So they've been making paint for a good long time now, over 130 years. Uh, and there's a lot of really great things about Sennelier paint, Sennelier oil paints that uh, we could dive into, whether it is you know, the satin finish that they, they have practiced millings for so long that they get perfectly, uh, or the 144 color range that has a lot of translucent colors that just really add to that kind of uh, impressionist experience. You know, they were making paint for the French, French impressionists uh, at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so their color palette is really influenced by that. But today, uh, we're going to start off by talking about the binder. A lot of people don't realize that Sennelier paints are bound in safflower oil. And most of us don't know really what safflower oil is, or I didn't know until I started researching it and trying to figure out why it's so special. Uh, so safflower oil is a really clear oil, which is why we use it in the Sennelier oil paints. Like I said, we have a lot of translucent colors, transparent, semi-transparent colors. Uh, so having that, that colorlessness, uh, that non-yellowing capability is really, really special. It, it makes sure that, you know, if you're putting down a glaze of blue, that it's not going to turn into a glaze of green. Uh, or if you're putting down a glaze of, of ye uh, yellow, that it's not going to become a dark yellow. It's going to stay glazed and give it just the effect you're looking for. Uh, but what is safflower oil? Safflower oil uh, comes from the safflower plant, which is a herbaceous thistle. And it is one of our oldest crops. It actually dates back to 2500 BC in Mesopotamia, 
uh, and it's been found in the tomb of King Tut. So we've, we've known about safflower and used safflower oil for a long time. Uh, most of history, we've used safflower oil in food production, uh, cosmetic production, all kinds of different things. It's, it's all relatively new that we're using it in paint, uh, but it's been around a long time, so we understand a lot about it. Now, mentioning that it's used in food production, I do want to note that there's two different kinds of safflower plant. I won't get into the specifics of it because I'm not a chemist and, and it's, it's very complicated, but essentially there's food grade safflower oil, which won't dry. So don't buy your safflower oil at the grocery store. And there is art grade safflower oil that does dry, uh, which is why art supply stores have very specialized safflower oil. Sennelier has specialized safflower oil. Uh, so don't try and mix in food grade safflower oil. It's a completely different plant and it responds a different way and you'll have gummy paint that never dries. Uh, so I really wanted to touch on the binder because it's so important to, to the clarity of the colors that Sennelier makes. And with that, I want to kind of dive into greens. So let me put the... Sorry, I just it just occurred to me. I forgot to mention at the beginning of this, in case everybody who's watching doesn't know, we're gonna have a giveaway. Oh yeah. So if you can mention that as well before I completely forget. <laughs> Absolutely. There will be a, a giveaway at the uh, at the end of the episode. So hang out until the end of the episode. Uh, I will ask a question at the end that will relate to something we talked about today. Uh, and if you answer that question in the comments, you're entered to win. And then the names will be drawn from a hat uh, or a basket or whatever it is that Emmy draws the names from. Uh, and the prize is going to be really exciting because at the end of the episode, I'll tell you what my three favorite green colors are that we talked about. And one person will win those, my three favorites. And I'll ask Emmy after we talk about the greens what her favorite three colors we talked about are. And somebody will win Emmy's favorite three colors. Uh, so hang in, hang in there and listen really carefully because uh, there will be a question at the end. Let me flip cameras real quick and we'll make sure that that looks okay. All right. Uh, so with that, I kind of want to jump, jump right into the greens. So Many of us, you know, we take green for granted. It's not a primary color, it's a secondary color. Uh, and because of that, we often think we can mix it ourselves. But in truth, we can't mix everything ourselves. Uh, and we, we maybe shouldn't mix every green color ourselves if we think we can't. Because there's a lot of green colors out there that are uh, single pigment colors, like Right here, I have two different cobalt greens, cobalt green light and cobalt green deep. Both of them are single pigment colors, which means that they come from a single, single mineral or single source. Uh, and we have cobalt green light. And cobalt green deep. Now, I found some really interesting things about cobalt green. And one of the most interesting things to me was that cobalt green was discovered in the 1780s. But cobalt blue, which we all know cobalt blue, we may not all know cobalt green, cobalt blue was discovered uh, in 1802. So cobalt blue came after cobalt green, but we have uh, a, much, a much more renown or understanding of, of cobalt blue. So that is really interesting to me that the, the origin of the cobalt colors, the cobalt green is lesser known. Uh, now cobalt green is really, really opaque. This is the cobalt green light. It's got that kind of a chalkboard color almost. And then we have cobalt green deep. Uh, cobalt green light is pigment code is PG19. Uh, and the cobalt Green deep is cobalt chromite green, and that is a PG26 or pigment green 26, which reminds me, I should tell you how to read paint tubes a little bit. Many of you already know, and every brand is a little different, but 
uh, on the paint tube here, if we can get us in focus, you can see we have the brand name, we have the sub brand name. So in this case, it's uh, Sennelier Extra Fine Artist Oils. Uh, and then we have the color name in a number of languages. So here we have French, English, uh, Spanish, German. And then we have our pigment uh, or our color number in the case of Sennelier, which is 845. And this is just internally within the Sennelier uh, brand. You can find number eight means that it's a green and then four or five is just where it falls on that spectrum. Uh, so eight, four, five, it's a series three. So for those of you who haven't bought paint that has series numbers before, it's a lot like buying jewelry. Different minerals have a different cost associated to them. Uh, so series three is going to cost more than a series two and less than a series four. Uh, and then we have these stars here. And the stars are going to indicate the light fastness. But if we flip it over, we get a little better picture of that. So you see... Am I in focus there? I need a lot of focus. It's a little blurry. <laughs> Just a touch. Uh, maybe down here. Cameras are so finicky. It'll go right into focus when I don't want it to. Yep. <laughs> close close so. enough. Close enough yeah. for now, maybe. Okay. So this little, it's a box. Uh, and on the tubes, you'll see that it's either a box that's colored in all black. Uh, which means that in this case, it's transparent because the background is black. Or if it's colored in all white, it's opaque. And if it's half and half, it's semi-transparent or semi-opaque. Uh, and then right here, it'll, it'll replicate that, but in words. So it has a T slash O, which means transparent slash opaque. So it's semi-opaque or semi-transparent. And we have the pigment codes which are the minerals that are ground up and put into the paint. And in this instance, in this instance, we have PY3, which is an azo yellow, and PG36, which is a phthalo green. Uh, and then we have the binder. So this says that it's bound in safflower oil. It has a light fastness rating. One is best, two is really good, and three is pretty good. Uh, and anything that's not a three won't be an artist grade paint. So it'll, you'll usually just see a one, a two, or a three, or an NR. In this case, it's a two. So it's a pretty good light fastness. It's gonna last much longer than we will. Uh, and then we have the, the, you know, the uh, volume. So in this case, 200 milliliters, uh, it's made in France. And then we have this, this logo here that says AP, uh, which is just a US stamp by ACMI. And that means that it is, uh, essentially non-toxic. If it needs any kind of a warning label, like if it's a cadmium color or a cobalt color, uh, you'll see a, uh, a CL on there, which means cautionary labeling is needed. So that's how we read our paint tubes. So when I talk about the cobalt green light uh, having a PG-19, that means pigment green 19, and that's the mineral where it falls on the spectrum or PG26 is pigment green 26, and that's where it falls. So they're both a cobalt green, but they're using different, uh, different cobalts essentially. So uh, we can't always, always assume that just because something says cobalt green, that it's gonna be the same color uh, from brand to brand. Because even within the same brand here, we see that we have two different cobalt greens. And some people believe that if it says cobalt green, deep or cobalt green dark, that it's just cobalt green with black added. And if it says cobalt green light, that it's cobalt green with white added. But as we see here, that is not the case. Neither of these colors have black or white and they are both, uh, both cobalt greens, both unique. And I'm just mixing in a little white here, how it tints. Now you did mention that the back of the label has that AP certification if it's non-toxic, but it has a CL if it is. And someone was asking, aren't cobalts toxic? Do you have a tube of the cobalt right there? So where you can see that- I do, CL? I do. Absolutely. Because yes, cobalts are toxic for the, the lovely person who was asking, but- um. If we what, can see that, that would be great. It's interesting that you say that because not every cobalt 
is toxic. So that is absolutely true, though. In the instance here of the cobalt green light, that is a PG 19. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this camera's really bugging me today. And you can see that it has a big exclamation point there, and it's got all these warning labels in there. Mm -hmm. It's just going to give you best practices for uh, cobalt. Now, mm -hmm. Out of that is European standards because this cobalt actually conforms to the AP label. So in the US, we, we don't necessarily have any cautionary labeling that's required, but we, we still have the European labeling on there that helps us see, you know, the US is sometimes going to have more labeling than, than Europe, sometimes less. Mm -hmm. Now, in the instance of the cobalt green deep, we we see that it has an AP logo and no, no labeling from Europe. So this one, uh, even Europe doesn't have any, any labeling needed. However, if we grab something like, like a cadmium green, and we flip it over, we see that we have a CL logo and then it has our Proposition 65 warning. Uh, so, we will see, you know, each color is gonna, gonna respond differently to that. This is another one that contains uh, some cadmium yellow. So it's got that Proposition 65 warning and the CL label on there as well. And uh, for anybody who is actually listening and is shopping online, uh, it, on the Jerry's website, there is uh, the little logo icons next to each tube of color and those, different individual uh, labels and warnings and things like that, that's where you're going to find that information in case you are looking specifically for non-toxic paints or just want to know what the toxicity level of your paints are. Each individual one, it's, it always varies so much. So just make sure you check those, those icons. You can click on them or hover over them and get more information that way. Fantastic. And there, there's also uh, links on most companies' websites, like Sennelier's website, uh, to the MSDS, which is the material safety data sheets. Uh, and those will have additional information if you need it for anything. Uh, but generally, the tube has as much information as you need uh, for a studio setting. All right, so we talked a little bit about cobalt, which is one of my favorites. It's kind of an underrated color, you know, comes in a wide spectrum. But another one that's really interesting to me uh, that a lot of us do know is. Viridian green. So here we've got Viridian green, which is extremely translucent, really rich green. Great tinting power. So let me mix in a little white and we'll show that. Uh, Viridian green is PG-18. And that's the, the color code for Viridian green. It's not, uh, it's not another, another mixture. This is one of our single pigment colors. So it's got this great kind of creme de menthe quality once you start mixing in, mixing in some white. But it's a very, very translucent color. Now, the, one of the more interesting things I found recently was that viridian green is a transparent form of chromium oxide green. And viridian was discovered in Paris in 1838. So not long after chromium oxide was discovered in 1797. And chromium oxide most of us will know it as a super opaque, uh, super opaque green, kind of the color of camouflage. You know, chromium oxide is used a lot in camouflage. So it was really surprising to me that these two colors come from the same chemical makeup. Uh, one is just a transparent version of, of the other, but they look so tremendously different. And the tinting power on them is, is different as well. 
just so you guys know, when I'm mixing, I'm mixing in titanium white, just to keep it simple. Sonelli's titanium white is just a really beautiful, heavy white, uh, high, high tinting power in it so that we can see how it, how it all responds. So those colors look nothing alike in my opinion, but they're both from the same family. So I, I find that really, really thoroughly interesting. It is insane how much they vary. Let's see. Camera's driving me crazy, sorry. <laughs> see if I shift something. That'll be a little better. Give it a shot. All right, so we talked about uh, cobalt, we talked about viridian and chromium oxide green. Uh, you know, there's other, other chromium oxide variations where uh, you'll see chromium oxide light or chromium oxide deep. And in some instances, there's colors added to achieve that. Uh, but sometimes it's, it's just a variation on this pigment. When you go to the, you know, when an when a art material company or like Sennelier goes to source their pigments, uh, the pigment manufacturers might have 20 or 30 things that are all labeled the same, but look a little different. They have to, they have to choose for themselves which one's going to fit right in that niche that they need. Uh, so viridian, chromium oxide, and then let's jump over to, it's not quite where I wanted to, uh, had planned on going, but I want to go there, is to our cadmium greens. So this one is Sennelier's cadmium green deep. And our permanent green, permanent yellow green, which contains cadmium. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, so cadmium green does have a pigment code, like we talked about with the others, which is PG14. Now it was really interesting for me to find out that PG14, pigment green 14, is actually a chemically fused combination of cadmium and cobalt. So ca cadmium green is actually a two pigment color, but they make a single pigment out of those two pigments. Chemically, <laughs> it's laboratory made. Now in the case of most companies now, they mix their own using cadmium yellow. So in the case of Sennelier, we wanted something that was pure and brighter than cobalt. Cobalt's a very low tint strength. Uh, it's a little bit on the, on the duller side in mixtures. So we went with cadmium yellow and a phthalo green. So you can see it's a very bright green for a cadmium green. And kind of in that same vein, we have our permanent yellow green, which is also a cadmium yellow base. So they're both using the same base, but they're giving us two very different, uh, very different mixtures here. So cadmium is very interesting to me as well. You know, cadmium, we think of it we think of it a lot as far as toxicity goes in art supplies. Uh, cadmium, a lot of people are eliminating it from their palette, which is, is good. If you wanna have a cadmium free studio, you know, I support that. If you don't want it there, don't have it. Uh, cadmium is, is relatively benign if you treat it correctly. So if you are gonna have cadmium in your studio, make sure that you're not spraying anything. You know, don't put cadmium through an airbrush. Don't sand anything that has cadmium. Make sure you clean all your tools really well. Uh, just respect it and, and it'll, be, it'll be okay. Uh, so it's not anything that I would suggest being afraid of. You know, uh, there are certain colors out there that I think we, we should definitely be cautious of when we have them in our studio, uh, like leads or anything that has you know, real copper in it, things like that. But with cadmium, if we, if we treat it the way that, that it's supposed to be treated, clean all of our tools, wash our hands, and everything things should be just fine. Uh, and as an example of all the things that we find cadmium in, you know, our bodies have a certain amount of cadmium in them. Uh, 
fillings and teeth for a long time had a substantial amount of cadmium in them. Uh, so it's, it's becoming less and less common, which is great. But as far as an art material, I wouldn't discount it. If it's a color that you think you need on your palette, just make sure that you treat it, treat it well. Don't eat your art supplies. Exactly. <laughs> even, it looks like icing, but don't eat it. <laughs> even non-toxic art supplies, they're not meant to be eaten. They can still do things to your body that you don't want your body to do. Very true. All right, now we've, we've dove into quite a few different greens here. And I've got my notes all mixed up. So let's see where we're, where we're going next. Okay, so we talked about the fact that that cadmium green is now using a base of phthalo greens. So let's talk a little bit about phthalo green. So here I have Sennelier's phthalo green cool. Uh, and this is probably the more common of the phthalo greens. Uh, this is PG7 or th uh, pigment green seven, which is a phthalo, or which stands for phthalo cyanine. So phthalo cyanine green blue shade. Uh, and often we use phthalo in the blue shade because we're looking for a cooler green. Uh, so you can see it has some similarities, in fact, to the viridian we were using earlier. So let me put some of that out there. And you can see, oops, the viridian. Viridian used to be used in a lot of mixtures to make, make things that we now use thalo for. And you can see that the thalo has more intensity to it. So now we use thalo as a base for tons and tons of different greens. Uh, we add it into different blue mixtures. We use it in a lot of different colors because it's super intense and it's extremely light fast. Uh, so phthalo cyanide pigments are, are really revolutionary. You know, if the old masters had some of these colors, then they, they would have been like kids in a candy store. Uh, we are in the best time in history to be painting because we have access to all of these colors. So we can still use a traditional vermilion, uh, vermilion a traditional viridian green pigment, or we can switch over to phthalo green. And you can see just from this, if they both look like they're going to achieve something similar to what you're going for, this is going to give you a whole lot more out of a tube. Uh, so switching to a modern color might be just what you're looking for. And just to, to reiterate, the one on the left is the phthalo green. This and one, then the one on the, Say that again? Th yep, phthalo green cool. And then over here, we have ver uh, viridian. Very nice. It's it's funny because uh, somebody earlier when you had the Viridian out, they were like, but how does it compare to Thalo Green? And I love that you have them right next to each other. It's so insane that they can be so similar, but so different. Absolutely. Let's see how they tint actually. Just out of my own curiosity, I haven't done a side by side on these before. So you guys are you guys are seeing it live on live. Love right. it. Ooh, look at that color. All right, now all my viewers know that that's probably gonna be my favorite color because it's just so pretty. <laughs> we have a thing about turquoisey blue greens on the show. Yes. Turqui <laughs> turquoisey blues and greens. Oh, and this is much earthier, yeah. It if is. I'm imagining this, I would not have imagined that they'd be so different once they tint out. That's crazy. They're both so beautiful though. They are a lot of fun. So phthalo, not looking at the uh, Viridian, phthalo is now the, the kind of the main ingredient in a lot of greens. So I wanted to pull aside some of the ones that it's become the main ingredient in uh, and talk a little bit about that. So we talked earlier, I showed you the big tube, but we talked about permanent green. And this is, what a lot of people see as kind of their, their grass green. Uh, permanent green has is, is become uh, quite a staple for getting that really 
bright green green, you know? So. Ooh, that's a bright color. <laughs> I love and it. That, and that contains uh, Aralide yellow or Hansa yellow. It has all kinds of names, uh, but let's not get started on that. But that contains Aralide yellow and phthalo green warm shade or, or uh, yellow shade. So where this one has the blue shade, this one has the yellow shade. So you can see that it's, it's warmed up and, and kind of gives it that sunshiny green color. Then we've also got a couple of, oh, here's a good, a good one for us to see how different two, two thalos can be. So we talked about this being thalo, uh, thalo green blue shade. This is Sennelier's sap green, which is a variation on phthalo green yellow shade. It has only one pigment in it. It's not a mixture. It's just phthalo green. But it's a completely different phthalo green than we're looking at over here. It has so much more yellow to it. It does. So between those two phthalos, they both have a great intensity and we can see the, the variety those two colors are going to be able to make using them as our main ingredients in a lot of mixtures. All right, I'm going to move this out of the way. And I'm saving these because we will play with these colors a little bit later too. I was just about to say, if you're anything like me, you're just moving them to the side and you're going to paint with them later. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Can't wait. No paint is wasted. All right. So. Barryite green, uh, I was going to talk about after another color, but I'll talk about it first because this, uh, this last weekend I went to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and I, I watched, uh, or I went to the exhibition of Joan Mitchell, uh, who was a, a fantastic abstract expressionist, if anybody is familiar with her work. Uh, she lived in uh, the U.S. I think she's from Michigan. She lived in New York and then she moved to Paris for you know, the second half of her life uh, or outside of Paris in France. But she lived in France uh, and a lot of her paintings, her abstract expressionist work had a lot of big green marks. And I was really surprised. I was looking at a display case of some of her tools and one of the colors she had there was baryite green. Uh, and I have only recently become more acquainted with this color because a friend of mine, Adrian Stein uh, swears by this color in, in some of her portrait work. Uh, so it's become a really, really fun, fun color exploration. And baryite green, I couldn't find a whole lot of history on, on the name. Uh, baryite is a type of, of white pigment. It's uh, lithopone or, uh, you know, a mixture of uh, barium and zinc. Uh, so baryite, doesn't naturally make a green, but perhaps when it first came out, it was a green that was mixed with that white color. I'm, I can't be for sure. If anybody can find more information on it, uh, you know, I welcome you to let me know because I, I am going to continue to research that till I find out what's going on. That is a lovely, lovely color. And uh, how do you spell baryite? Just for is, my personal. <laughs> Well, and I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly. Uh, so let, let's actually, if I read it, we'll call it barite. Uh, it's B-A-R-Y-T-E. B-A-R-Y-T-E. Exactly. And it is a couple of colors we've already seen. So if we think back to that permanent green that we had, let me grab that sheet. So this grassy green that we did uh, had the phthalo uh, phthalo green plus the Hansa yellow or azo yellow. Uh, and this has those same two colors, but mixed with white. So one of the experiments I want to do, because we all think, oh, we can add, you know, we can add a little bit of white to something and we can achieve what, what we get right out of the two. Now, first, in some instances we can. But is it worth the trouble if it's a color we use often? Uh, 
So I don't, in, in the instance of something like barite green, I would rather have a tube on hand because I know I'm gonna reach for it now that it's become one of my kind of play toys. Uh, all right, so we're gonna, we're gonna mix in some of this and see how close it gets. But right now it looks a lot more yellow. So they have the same pigments, but they could be different pigment sources even. You can see no amount of mixing. Is this going to give me this? This is a much bluer tone, even though it's using the same colors. It's giving me very much uh, like Grinch vibes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That yellowy Absolutely. green. I love it. Well, I, I must admit that one of the reasons I wanted to mix green, well, there's two reasons actually that I thought about green for this episode. Uh, the first is that I was looking at trends for next year and a lot of the house paint companies uh, are making green, gray or some variation of that, their color of the year. No kidding. Uh, the thing that was interesting to me is that it is, you know, it's starting to be winter, at least most places. And I'm always thinking of the forest or greenery. Uh, so it just kind of signifies winter to me, maybe because all the other trees lose their leaves. And so I can actually see a lot more of the, the pine and the cypress. Uh, so green really kind of symbolizes winter for me. And I thought being the last episode of Jerry's Live for the winter, then maybe it's, maybe it's a good time to explore some greens. I could probably make an argument for green in the summertime too, but I, this is just how I was feeling today. So, especially those uh, the phthalo and the viridian, those nice, cool kind of green, bluey green kind of vibes. I like absolutely, it. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Whereas this one's got that that more subdued white. Uh, you know, you'd also almost expect this to be in kind of a, like a pop art or, or graphic painting, uh, mm -hmm. even though it's such a common traditional color. Now, another one that is kind of in the same family as this bright green is emerald green. I'll squeeze some of this out here too. And this has become one of my favorites. I think a lot of these have become my favorites. That, that doesn't mean I use them a lot, but it means I like to have them around. So emerald green has, a, has an interesting history in that the original emerald was a copper arsenic color. Uh, it actually is a, another name. Let's see. So the original emerald green is PG21 or pigment green 21. It is copper aceto arsenic, aceto arsenic or no. Copper aceto arsenite. There we go. Uh, it was founded in 1822. And surprisingly, it was used until the 1960s. And I say surprisingly because the original emerald green was extremely toxic. Yeah, I was going to say, you want to talk about toxicity. Yeah. Arsenic in there. Yeah, so we, you know, we think of colors like cadmiums and cobalts that we're trying to eliminate from our palette. Uh, and they, they may not be good for us, depending on how we treat, you know, our palate and our space. Uh, but they don't, they don't come after us. Uh, whereas emerald green, the copper aceto arsenite, it came after you. Uh, it, it, wanted to, it wanted to be with you. So uh, it's now that's not what's in your actual paint right now, right? It's not. It's not. Okay. At all. We'll dive into that. I was but, like, do I need to call someone? <laughs> We should make a horror movie about, about the original uh, emerald green. So the original emerald green was used, it was really in fashion. They even used it in makeup, uh, oh, but no. popular for things like wallpaper. So it's claimed, uh, and I've read it in multiple sources, uh, that when Napoleon was exiled to St. Helena, he had bright green wallpaper in his house and it didn't react well to the humidity on the island. So it released arsenic fumes 
that may have exacerbated his demise. Wow. This is a color that may have killed Napoleon. Napoleon was taken out by wallpaper. <laughs> it's true. Uh, now, because of course we don't want that in our paint, we don't want it in our studio, we don't want it anywhere near us, uh, or, or my cats, of course. Of so course. Sennelier mixes their emerald green to match the original, but we're using that magical color we talked about earlier, phthalo green. So now we have phthalo green, uh, and we mix it with a little bit of that azo yellow. We mix it with a little bit of titanium white. And it's a virtual match for the original emerald, uh, but without that toxicity. That's so, awesome to know. <laughs> so the fact that, that phthalo green came around may have been a life-saving invention. All right. Now... So far, we've talked about a lot of single pigment colors. We talked about a few mixtures, but I want to talk about one that I always kind of thought was going to be a single pigment color, but now I've learned it's a mixture. So cinnabar green. Ooh, this one is one of my favorites. Uh, yeah, we hear the word cinnabar, and a lot of us think of lead arsenic, things like that because of, of cinnabar red. Uh, but when it comes to green, it, it never contained those things, which is interesting. It just has a similar name for popularity's sake. So Sennelier, we make three different cinnabars, cinnabar green deep, cinnabar green light, and a cinnabar, a yellow cinnabar green. Uh, and cinnabar was originally, I come to find, cinnabar was originally the name uh, of greens that were mixed with uh, Prussian blue and chrome yellow. And of course, chrome yellow wasn't good for it either, but we're not using that anymore. I bet you guys can guess what these three paints are made with. We're making our cinnabars out of a mix of phthalo blue, or th sorry, phthalo green, along with some other added colors to get the, the traditional colors we're looking for. Uh, and within that cinnabar family, we'll see that there's some pretty big variations here, but they're all matching a historic color. You know, Sonelli has been making these paints uh, for 130 plus years. So at the time they originally were making them, they were using some of the original pigments that we no longer utilize. So when they go to match it, they had those in front of them. They were, the chemists there were able to uh, exactly match colors as best they could using uh, safer, safer, smarter pigments, more modern. So here we have cinnabar green deep. Now here, here's a surprise, but it's, it's common in older paint manufacturers for this to happen. We have cinnabar green light which as you can see is nowhere near what I would have thought based on that color. But it's a much earthier color, much more brown into it. That looks like it would be amazing for um, plein air painting. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then we have cinnabar or yellow cinnabar green which kind of gets back into that cadmium realm we were looking at earlier, with that really vivid, vivid grassy color. So we can look at these and say that they, they have really nothing in common, except for the fact that they're all using a phthalo green and that they're all a mixture. And cinnabar green really kind of indicates that for me. And now, now I'll expect to find a really beautiful mixture uh, when I see the word cinnabar on a tube. Of course, there's still, you know, cinnabar red and things like that, that, that some companies are still manufacturing. So take a look at the backs of those tubes like we talked about. Make sure that you read up on it. Uh, you know, be, use your own discretion. If it has a warning label, follow the guidelines on those warning labels. Uh, if it has an AP, then you're in good shape. You still don't want to eat it. We talked about that. You still don't definitely don't, don't eat your orange flies. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, so um, before you actually take that away, can you tint out that cinnabar green light? 
Absolutely. Actually, you know, I'll, I'll tint them all three out nice. so that we can see the tinting power of all three of them. Because it is, it's so dark, it almost appears black, but like, I know where you scraped it away, we can see some of those undertones, but... It has a lot more of that like swampy yellow color. Yes. <laughs> Reminds me of home, Florida. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There's the trending color of 2022. Right yeah. there, gray green. <laughs> it almost gets, you know, ochre. Yeah. Now, uh, somebody was asking, when, you, when you're saying mixtures, uh, that these paints are a mixture, uh, to, to know it is a mixture, um, you would look at the label, correct? Exactly. So when you look at the back of those tubes, uh, in the case of, let's say, we're looking at our cobalt light, and it'll say pigment, and we'll just... Sorry guys, it's not in focus. That's gonna drive me nuts. Uh, so here it just says PG19. So pigment green 19. So that's why we call it a single pigment color. There's only one pigment noted there. Then I pick up our, let's pick up one we're using. Uh, we'll pick up our cinnabar green light. Now, if I look at this color, I'm gonna see that it has PR101, which is pigment red 101, uh, which is synthetic iron oxide red, uh, can be used for anything really from Venetian red to burnt sienna. So it's, it's uh, just that it's a synthetic iron oxide. We don't know which one they're using. It's got PG36, which is that phthalo green, pigment green 36. It's got PY83, uh, which is pigment yellow 83 or deerylide yellow. And uh, PY154, which of course, I don't know that one off the top of my head. Is that a azo yellow? Might be an azo yellow. Um, PY154? Yeah. Could be nickel azo maybe? No. It might be. I'm trying to remember. There's it's, so it's many. It's in that azo family, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, so in this instance, we're looking at four pigments that are mixed in this tube. And a lot of us will say, well, there's four pigments in there, so I'm gonna get mud. And that's, that's kind of a misnomer because you and I can take four single pigment colors and mix them on this palette. And we can only mix it to what our palette knife or our brush is gonna allow us to mix, to grind. And so we might get some optical muddiness or we'll block out some of the light dispersion but when it's in the Sennelier factory, it's going through a triple roll mill. It's got three rollers on that are made out of granite. It pushes it through there and it squishes all those pigments together. And it goes through there a number of times till it's the right consistency. And it, while it's doing that, it's putting a tremendous amount of pressure on the paint and it's mixing it in ways that we just don't have the capacity to do in our studio. So when they mix pre-mixed colors in a factory, you're getting a much, much cleaner color than you could try to achieve on your palette. So if you see four colors on, a, on the back of a tube, it's not necessarily something to be afraid of. Uh, you're not necessarily going to get mud, uh, but if you take those same four colors, then it's something you'll want to you know, assess as you go. All right, so we have some fun with cinnabar. There we go. Uh, and I've got a, a couple other fun colors I want us to talk about. Actually, I've just got one more in the green family. So, so far we've been using colors from the green family from Sennelier. So all these are gonna start with the number eight. They're all in the 800 series because that's our green series. So here I have golden green which is kind of at the end of the green spectrum for, for Sennelier. 
And we're starting to head into our Earth spectrum, our Earth colors. And golden green, uh, some companies call it green gold. Uh, it is a relatively modern color. Uh, it's using this, this uh, kind of a Nicolazo base. Now, in this instance, it had a name I, I didn't recognize readily because we call it so many different things. But this is pigment yellow 129, PY 129, uh, which is actually called ergazin yellow. Uh, and I'm not familiar with ergazin. I just know that most companies use it for their green golds and everybody's green gold is a little different. So Sennelier's green gold is really, really, really nice. Single pigment, really bright. Uh, and it gives us this, this almost yellow green. So when they call it gold, think, think of like golden leaves, you know? not like a metallic gold, but more like what we'd see on fall, fall trees. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I'm in California. Here in California, it'd be like what what we see on the hills, you know, in the in the uh, summer, the golden hills. So it's kind of like a, a bright, transparent version of a yellow ochre. But it's a little more acidic. I'm a really big fan of this color. That is lovely. All right, and then that is actually the last one on the green spectrum that I wanted to talk about. And it's probably our newest pigment in the bunch. Uh, I couldn't find exact dates, but I, I think that this one came about sometime in the 80s, uh, maybe early 90s. So it's a, a really modern pigment. I believe it was in, created for the car industry. You know, we want things that are light fast, that are not gonna dull, not gonna oxidize. Uh, so this is what we what we get, and we're very very lucky that we have all these industries around us that want to produce colors. So now we're jumping into a couple of colors. There's two colors I brought with me today that uh, start with a two, so they're in the 200 series, which means that they're earth colors. So this one is green earth. And green earth, PG23, pigment green 23, which is actually the pigment for green earth. So we don't have to think too hard on that one. Uh, and green earth dates back to uh, the Roman times, the fifth century. Uh, it was found in murals in Pompeii, uh, virtually every Every civilization has, has used this color. Uh, you know, oil painting didn't become a thing until the seventh century and then didn't really uh, become widely spread until 500 years after that. So this color predates oil painting by a substantial amount. And it's still used very, very often. Uh, and the most common use for this color is to, to do two things, to tint backgrounds and as an underpainting layer for portraits. I do love that color for portraiture. That, I, I, that's what I, I do a lot of. So that one, like in the uh, like five o'clock shadow, kind of in your jawline kind of an area, that's where I usually find that color. Definitely. And anything that's warm is just going to pop right off that surface really well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm always, always a big fan of that. I like to tone my surfaces uh, and I do a variety of different colors when I tone, but this is definitely one that I like. I got to keep track of time. Oh my goodness. I was going to say it's 625. We can go a little late. It's okay. <laughs> All right, uh, and then the other earth color I grabbed, just because it's on my palette, it's one I use, I'd say every day if I had time to paint every day, but it's, it's a color I use every time I paint. Uh, and this one is a mixture uh, that doesn't actually contain phthalo. So let's, let me tell you about that just a little bit. This one is called Greenish Umber, and it is PY83, pigment yellow 83, which is Dierlide yellow. 
PBK7 Pigment Black 7, uh, which is Lamp Black, and PB60, uh, which is Indanthrin Blue. So it's a, it's a really deep mixture, deep, dark mixture. So I treat this one like a black, and it's just got that hint of green-blue undertone. Uh, oops, sorry, guys. Uh, so this one is really, really dark, darkest we've seen today. Oh, wow. And we consider this an earth color, but I, I took it out today because it has enough green in it for me to keep it in my green family. And when you mix it out with, with a little white, you get this great gray. That is incredible. Now, one more time, the color of this paint is? This is greenish umber. Greenish umber. Because you guys know, while we're watching this, I'm sitting here writing down all the colors that I need to get. <laughs> See, it's not green, it's greenish. It's so pretty though. It is, it is. It's, it's wonderful that you can actually really get those darks uh, just accomplished with a green color. And while I have this out, one of the things I, I often use, you know, I time flew today while we were talking about all these greens. I actually was going to start a painting with a bunch of these greens too, but I don't think we'll have time for it. So in that painting, I was going to use one of my, my new favorites, my medium here. And this is Sennelier's Green for Oil Gel Medium. And what this is, is a all natural, biodegradable, non-toxic gel medium. It doesn't speed up the drying time much, but it extends the paint and the translucency so that we can get these great glazes. And that does not speed up the drying time? It doesn't, it not notice. Oh. It doesn't have any alkyds or dryers in it. Mm -hmm. So it just extends the paint and glazes really nicely. Uh, so I will grab just a little something real quick and we'll put down a quick glaze just so everybody can see. Did a quick little sketch earlier and I got my, my handy Raphael Paris Classics, which are a, a boiled hog bristle. So they have, have a really nice soft quality to them. And then I'm gonna grab some of that color that I just glazed, add that glazing medium to. And we will start over here. So it extends it just really, really nicely glazed. So when I go back to, to go over it, I'll have this translucency here. You can grab a little bit of something brighter to try and show it off. Add a little drop of the green for oil to that. So if I were to keep glazing, I could let these, these layers kind of set up and bring it back and just keep kind of stumbling new glazes over the top. But I don't want to keep everybody here for a few more hours. So. <laughs> I mean, I honestly could sit there and just watch you paint.
All right. Uh, so with that, were there any questions that anybody had that I didn't catch while we were? Uh, I think we, we've kind of sprinkled them in as we were going along. So I think we got them all. Um, that glazing medium though, is that archival just to double check? It is totally. Nice. It's hard to see. That light's kind of blowing it out a little bit. There you go. All right. So Sennelier Green for Oil Gel Medium uh, Archival. It's using you know all all artist grade materials, uh, fruit and vegetable, natural. Uh, if you get the smaller size containers, it's even airplane friendly. We make sure it's less than a uh, hundred milliliters. So. Grab those smaller sizes and they will they'll travel travel very well. Very nice. Now uh, we had a question for everyone for that giveaway. Did did we not? We do. All right. Uh, so I hope everyone's paying attention. So today's question is: What is the oldest color or pigment that we talked about today? You can call call out the color or the pigment, uh, but just let me know what the oldest one we talked about was. All right, so I'm gonna be letting everyone add in the answers to that uh, up until about, let's say uh, 6.45 tonight. If you uh, at least get your answer in uh, before 6.45 PM. So as soon as we log off here, you can still comment on this video because it's still available uh, for re-watching. Re even if you do cough, cough, hint, hint, need to go back through and listen to a couple of things. So if you guys do, make sure to put that, uh, comment your answer in the, the chat below, and then I will go through and pull everyone's name who answered it correctly. Now, what they get to win, we still have to pick, don't we? We do. So we're- Here, let me actually switch the view so everyone can see me too. <laughs> so this is a good time for me to ask, what were your three favorite colors today? Sitting there writing down all the, all the colors, and I was like, oh, I need this one. Yeah, I have a long list over here. So um, quickly to choose because I want them all. <laughs> uh, of course, the phthalo green cool shade. I cannot help myself. Love me a phthalo green cool shade. I just, it's beautiful. Um, let's go with the golden green because that was just really pretty. It's got that nice, beautiful, like, yellowy tint to it uh, and then that greenish umber that was beautiful I think I'm going to stick with those three. Oh my even though God. I'm going to be ordering a lot more than that now I've got to change all my answers no I'm just kidding <laughs> uh, so the three that I have found myself using the most lately are well obviously the greenish umber I talked about so that's going to be on my list as well the other two are a little bit more challenging for me, uh, especially after we talked about them today. It's hard to choose, isn't it? It really, really is. That's so why I just come uh, with a knee-jerk reaction. <laughs> Cobalt green light. Ooh, that was pretty. Really, really underrated. And I love that color. It's not a heavy tinter, but it's a really, really fun color to play with. As I'm looking around at all these puddles of paint around me. And the other one, let's go with Cinnabar Green Light. That's the darker one. It is. And I, I, I do have a question about that. Why is it called light if it's darker? You know, it happens a lot in the, in the world of paint, and I don't know why. I wish I had an answer. That's one that is stumping me. So maybe we'll. We'll have to look into that for, for next time. Uh, if awesome. I could guess, I would guess that one came out before the other one. And the same thing happens in, in our ultramarine blue. Ultramarine uh, deep is a lighter color than ultramarine light. I'll have to, I'll have to deep dive that next. <laughs> that's, I, I say this every time. That's why we always tell people that you need to pay attention to that pigment code on the tube is that the companies that make these things can name them whatever they want to name them. 
it's the pigment that really is the most important thing to pay attention to. But even then, as you were showing us, you can have a mixture of two pigments and get such a huge variety in how they make it. And it's just, it's insane, but or, lovely or cadmium, the, the pigment code for cadmium red is the same, whether you're getting cadmium red light, cadmium red, cadmium red deep, cadmium red purple in some cases. Uh, so even the color, even the pigment code isn't, isn't a guarantee. So yeah, it's very experiential, definitely. Uh, you know, watch your paint. Watch Jerry's live and you'll get to see the paint in action. Yes, definitely. Well, that was, I believe everything, correct? Absolutely. I want to cut you off. Uh, but uh, remember guys, answer that question again, uh, just to make sure that you have the question, what is the oldest uh, color or pigment that Andrew was talking about today? You have until 645 to put that answer in the chat below and we will draw names in the next few days here for the winners. Uh, there will be two winners. One will win my favorite three and one will win uh, Andrew's favorite three colors. So make sure to answer that, even if you um, just copy whoever was answering before. Uh, but uh, that was Jerry's Live, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you again, Andrew, for joining us. It was such an amazing uh, thing to see all the different greens. And now I need to go get them all. So. Thank you for having me. I was really excited to be able to experiment live. And I can't wait to see what we do next time. Definitely, definitely. And again, reminder for everyone out there, uh, if you are interested in checking out all of the colors and things that Andrew was using, go to the website jerrysartorama.com and in the search bar code type, or in the search bar type in today's class code, which was JL222. And then everything that he was showing us, all those beautiful grains should come up as well as the titanium white and the brushes you were using. So, um, Make sure you check it out there. And then uh, this is the last show of 2021. So you'll be taking off for the month of December and we will come back in January with all kinds of new things planned. And it's going to be amazing. I'm already working on planning some things and I'm so excited to show you guys. So it's, it's going to be awesome. So join me in January and I will see you guys then. Thank you so much. Bye.